Hi everyone, Stepan here. In today's middle game video, I'm going to talk about space advantage, uh, which is one of the key points to a successful game and often one of the things which brings victory during the game. There are a couple of points that I would like to highlight uh, about space advantage and we are going to go over them before we look at probably, I think they are among 10 most famous games where space advantage was utilized properly and where players uh, got the maximum out of it. Before I start, I just like I would just like to say thank you for for the support and the kind comments and the kind emails and everything. It really means a lot. Uh, sorry if I'm unable to answer all of your messages instantly. I try to, and all of the comments, I will try to do my best in the future. Uh, so space advantage. First of all, uh, a space advantage is something that you achieve using pawns. Uh, you can't really get it using pieces, except in very rare cases where pieces act as blockaders and where your pieces will outplay your opponent's pieces in a way that they are cramped uh, out of maneuvering space and basically unable to move. But as I said, it's much more common to achieve a space advantage using pawns. Some openings, as is the position on the board, uh, give one side uh, a clear space advantage or after just a couple of moves. This is the advanced Karo Khan, uh, in which white obviously has a space advantage. Now, the most common type of space advantage in a game is when white has his e pawn on e5, which means that his pawn is cutting through his opponent's position. If you divide the board in two, uh, with each side having four ranks, then white's pawn is obviously in black's position and white's pawn is occupying the space which black should be occupying. So this pawn is a sort of criminal which is... Uh, well, uh, he is making black's play much harder. So this pawn is controlling the d6 square and the f6 square, which are two key squares in the position. Often black is going to want to develop his f8 bishop to d6, or uh, more commonly his g8 knight uh, to f6. And you can see that this pawn is not allowing that. So a space advantage is something that in its essence prevents your opponent from using his space properly. If you reverse the position, if you give black an advanced pawn, then black, of course, has a space advantage. Now, this is the first thing. You have a space advantage when you have a pawn structure which is infiltrating your opponent's position. One thing that, sh that should be highlighted is that a space advantage is always good. Uh, even though sometimes you might overextend and you might uh, misplay with your, with your pawns and overextend them, put them in your enemy territory where they are weak or in the way of your pieces, generally a space advantage is a good thing unless uh, you misplay it and then your overextended pawns become something you have to defend or they obstruct your pieces. The two most common mis mistakes people make is that they will, and I'm going to use one example for that, let me just get a new board, uh, let's say uh, black plays the Alakine defense, you play the move e5, and uh, after the move e5, this pawn is often uh, a liability in black's position, and white is going to have to defend it throughout the game, even though it gives white a distinct uh, space advantage. So be careful when moving your pawns forward, because achieving a space advantage could have, with all of its benefits, a lot of downsides. So this pawn is obviously a space advantage and the space advantage is good, but the downside is that the pawn is going to have to be defended, that let's say the f3 knight doesn't have the e5 square, it has to keep the defense. So there are upsides and, downs and downsides to achieving a space advantage. Another common position like this is uh, in the Berlin defense, in the Ber Berlin endgame, where black has doubled pawns along the c-file, but white has the overextended e5 pawn, which if white doesn't get his pawn majority going, it's going to be hard to defend and it's going to be more of a weakness than a strength. Uh, the space advantage doesn't have to be in the center. As I said, most commonly it's going to be the e5 pawn. Uh, it could be uh, some other pawns, obviously, it could be any pawn, but wherever you are overextended, uh, in your opponent's position on that side of the board you have the space advantage. In this case, this is just a random position I've set up on the board, uh, white has a pawn on a5, white has a pawn on c5. That means that these pawns are controlling uh, the b5 square and uh, the b6 square and the d6 square 
and that way disrupting Black's play, not allowing him to defend properly. The second point I would like to highlight is that whenever you have a, a space advantage, whenever you have pawns in your opponent's position, that means that you have great potential outpost, uh, outposts. The further your pawns are in your opponent's position, uh, the higher the chances that you are going to have an unprotected square to utilize. So obviously, if you manage to get a pawn on the sixth rank, you are definitely going to have outposts, because even though there might be a pawn uh, on d7 or on b7, in this case, these squares are going to be weak. So if you put the white pawn on c6, then these two squares are perfect outposts. So the further your pawn go, goes down, down the board in your opponent's position, uh, the higher the likelihood that you are going to have outposts. In this case, obviously, white has two uh, gorgeous squares to exploit, b6 and d6. And now we come to utilizing the advantage. If you have a space advantage, there are two upsides to that. Firstly, you have more space for your pieces. Secondly, your opponent has less space for his pieces, as we are going to see in the two example games. So, utilizing a space advantage uh, is something that you need to learn how to do. Just having a space advantage doesn't mean anything. If you have this uh, tremendous pawn structure on the queen side, and you decide to put your knights uh, on f3 and on g4 instead of b6 and d6, then you are unaware of the advantage that you have, and if you don't utilize it properly, it's as if it didn't exist in the first place. Now, pieces uh, that are best uh, for utilizing a space advantage. Usually the rule is that whichever side has a space advantage doesn't want to trade off the minor pieces. So if you have less space, if your opponent has a space advantage, then your goal should be to exchange the minor pieces, because the minor pieces are what are, are uh, those that can utilize a space advantage. So obviously, if this uh, file was closed, let's say black has a pawn on d5, then it's really hard to do anything with your queen or with your rooks. Your bishops and your knights, on the other hand, can shine in this position. Get a bishop to d6, get a knight to d6, get a knight or bishop to b6, and your position is completely winning. So if you have more space, don't trade off the minor pieces, Try to find a way to infiltrate your opponent's position and use the space wisely. Uh, rooks and queens, on the other hand, you can afford to exchange. So often, in positions when, when, where one side has more space, uh, lesser experienced players can't understand why they would trade off the rooks, why they would trade off the queens. In this exact position, if you imagined both sides had a pair of rooks and a queen, let's say rooks were here, the queens were here, white would benefit from the exchange more, because if you if you remove the pieces that can't utilize the space advantage, then the remaining pieces are going to have a much easier time. Obviously, if you have a space advantage without any pieces on the board, then it's even better. In this case, everything white has to do is march his king up the board, somehow get to the d6 square, and he's going to win the game. If black can prevent that, then it could be a draw, but that's not highly likely. In this position, in the pawn endgame, it's uh, almost center certain that white could win. In fact, let's check with the engine. This is just a random position. Uh, the engine gives this as plus one, so yeah, it's winning. You can block out uh, the black king, take the opposition, infiltrate d6, and that's the only plan you have. But a space advantage should be utilized during the middle game. So remember, uh, and let's uh, take another position. Uh, this is a King's Indian type setup. So obviously white has a space advantage. The extended d pawn uh, controls e6, controls c6. And of course, players who play the King's Indian accept this, know this, try to find counterplay with pawn breaks, with f5. So whenever you have a space advantage, don't trade off the minor pieces. Try to infiltrate the outpost squares and one very important thing, when you have a space advantage on one side of the board, the best thing you can do is try to create it on the other side of the board as well. Very often, your opponent is going to be overworked and he's going to have to stop your pieces from uh, utilizing the space advantage properly, and that will give you time to play some more pawn moves and take some more space. So in this case, let's imagine the white pawns on a5 and on b4, let's imagine this pawn on h4, this pawn on g4. This will mean that white has even more space, and white has even more potential for taking up the squares black could use. So obviously, if, you, if your pieces have no space to maneuver, it's best to uh, get them off the board. So if you have space, don't trade off the pieces. Now let's look at the game. Uh, the first game, I, I think you know both games. Uh, these games have been annotated a hundred times, but 
there are huge lessons to be learned from, from them. The first game is Lasker Campa Blanca from 1914, uh, the St. Petersburg tournament. Uh, in this game, Capablanca was better. Uh, Capablanca is black here, he is better here. And uh, this was the exchange Roy Lopez. So the doubled C pawns for black. And uh, what uh, what Lasker did in this game was remarkable. He, I think he chose the opening just to get uh, what Capablanca likes best for him. So he is playing a slightly better endgame. Capablanca has doubled C pawns. Lasker has no structural weaknesses, so he is playing Capablanca in his own game. He's trying to outplay him in a slightly better endgame. In this position, uh, trying to prevent the move e5, uh, Capablanca played f6, which is a logical move. And now, uh, a move which is mm, almost insane, uh, which I'm not sure I would ever consider. And in all of the other annotations of the game I've seen, most people were surprised by this move and then they praise it afterwards. In this position, Emmanuel Lasker uh, played the move f5. Now, this move uh, seems very bad uh, when you first look at it. It's giving away the e5 square, definitely. It's uh, definitely uh, cutting any chances from, black playing e from white playing e5 in the future. It's giving a tremendous square for the knight on e5, and if this knight ever gets to e5, let's say c5, knight c6, knight e5, then black is going to be more than equal. But the move f5 has a clear purpose in mind. Let's look at some of the pieces. And by the way, uh, in this position, Capablanca was still better. Capablanca played b6, and we have bishop to f4. Now, what Lasker is playing for, he's trying to trade off the only active piece and leave black with his bad bishop on, on c8. So now, uh, Capablanca had a good choice to make here, and he could have made his position uh, much better and much easier to play. The best way to play this position, obviously, is to activate your bishop, and you do that by playing bishop takes f4, rook takes f4, and simply c5. After c5, you are ready for bishop b7, putting pressure on e4, you are ready for knight c6, knight e5, and if you manage to play bishop b7, knight c6, knight e5, then your position is going to be better, and uh, obviously Capablanca would stand great here. Instead of that, after bishop to f4, he played bishop b7, and now the difference is huge. Uh, bishop takes d6 by Lasker, c takes d6, I'm doubling pawns, but it doesn't matter. And now knight to d4, knight to d4, now look at this outpost. You have a space advantage, your extended f5 pawn is controlling the e6 square, you're going to take up that square with the knight. The difference is, is that had Capablanca played c5, how do you play knight d4? You would have to go around, around, and around, and this pawn would be attacked by the bishop, and it would have been a whole different game. Now rook a to d8, knight to e6. In this position, Lasker not only managed to equalize, but his position is now all overwhelmingly better. And it's really hard for, for Capablanca to put pressure on the e4 pawn when the knight is here, because the rook can't help. And in this position, positionally, I think Capablanca is very upset and already almost lost. So. What he did with the move f5 was quite counterintuitive. He gave up a lot of squares, he gave Capablanca, that's true, an opportunity to get out of the mess with bishop takes f4 and c5, but he didn't. So his space advantage is now going to have a major say in the position. Rook d7, rook a to d1, getting all of his pieces to the best possible squares. Knight to c8, and it's really hard to challenge this knight. I mean, how do you do that? You would have to get your knight uh, to c5 somehow. Rook to f2 b5. If you can't play uh, c5, then, I mean, b5 is sort of logical. If you play c5, then you're giving away this square, and if you give away uh, the d5 square, then knight d5, and black has no moves. So at the moment, because white has a space advantage, black has four pieces which are doing nothing. The, the, the best idea might be to give up the exchange, and Capablanca should have done this during the game, but it's really hard to give up the exchange. Now rook f to d2, Rook d2 e7, b4. This is the crucial move, b4. Why did he play b4? Because black obviously has more space on the queen side, and now he is restricting that play. It's really hard to do anything after the move b4. Uh, king f7, a3, defending in advance. This move wasn't necessary, but he is trying to make his position perfect. If you have a space advantage, uh, 
you can wait and you can try to build up on that advantage. As I said, when you have a, a space advantage on one side on the board, in this case, Lasker has it on the king side, he first made sure that uh, Capablanca doesn't get the same on the queen side. b4, a3. Okay, quiet moves. Bishop a8. I mean, this, this is just a nothing move. I mean, this is nothing. King f2, <clears throat> before going in for utilization of his uh, space advantage, he's making all of his pieces perfect. Rook a7. g4, grabbing space, more space on the king side. h6, rook to d3. a5, h4. And this is what I was talking about. When you have a space advantage, take more space, because your opponent can't do anything. In this position, Capablanca might be threatening to infiltrate the, the, the queen side somehow, ab4, ab4, rook a to e7, but it's really hard to do that because you are dropping an exchange. So if, if he had played his rook back here to, to a2, then obviously knight to c7 would fork rook uh, and bishop. Rook a to e7, king to f3, making his king better, grabbing more space with his pieces now. Rook to g8, getting away from this fork. King f4, g6, rook to g3, preparing for the opening of the king side. g5 check, uh, a concession Capablanca made because, well, if he doesn't do that, if he doesn't block out the king side, then Lasker is going to be better. King to f3, an interesting decision, not opening the file. Now after knight b6, hg5, hg5, white has the opportunity to take the file in a couple of moves. He's not losing it. Rook to h3, rook d7, king to g3. And now uh, the second point, as soon as something opens up. So once you have a space advantage, the best way to utilize it is to grab the open space. In this case, you already have a knight on the perfect square. Knight, the knight on c3 is kind of misplaced, but it can get into the game. But the h file is open, the a file is open. It's very logical to take up these files because that's the easiest way to cramp black even more and force him into the defense. King to e8, rook, h to, uh, rook d to h1, bishop b7, e5. And this, uh, well, this move is opening up the position. Perhaps it's too early. Uh, I would, I think, be scared to play this move, but it's actually a perfect move because after d takes e5, knight to e4, he freed up some space for his knight. The point of e5 was making a square for his knight and now the f6 pawn is very weak. Knight d5, knight 6 uh, to, to c5, bishop c8, knight takes d7, taking the exchange, bishop takes d7, rook h7. This is all but over and in two moves Capablanca resigned. So coming back to the original position, uh, here, after knight to b3 for white, f6 a very logical move. How many of you would find the move f5? The engine doesn't like it, uh, because had Capablanca played correctly, then this move doesn't make any sense. But in these circumstances, it was perfect. It was a simple space gaining move, restricting black species, playing against the bishop on c8, and he did it perfectly. b6. Bishop f4. Capablanca's chance was bishop takes f4, rook takes f4, c5, and after rook d1, bishop b7, rook d7, rook a to c8. Capablanca has an advantage. This bishop is now a monster piece, much better than any of the knights, so he could have survived the position. Okay, another game. Uh, this is probably more famous, even. This is one of Karpov's uh, most famous games, Karpov und Sikker from the Olympiad. 1974. Uh, this is a very uh, theoretical position from the Chigorin, uh, closed Roy Lopez Chigorin variation. And here Karpov played the main move. The main move is d5. After d5, uh, obviously white is grabbing space. After knight to d8, he's controlling two key squares in black's position. And many, many games from this position went in black's favor because white didn't utilize, utilize his space advantage properly. But in this game, Karpov just... Uh, I think this is one of the most sadistic games ever played in chess. Okay, so a4, taking space on the, on the queen side. Rook to b8, a takes b5, a takes b5. Okay, b4, after b4, what just happened? The only open file on the board is in white's uh, grips, and white is controlling the a file. This is going to be the theme of the game, and white has more space. So where can the black pieces move? Let's think about each piece individually. This bishop has b7, which is ridiculous, doesn't have a6 because it's hanging, has d7, which is ridiculous, doesn't have e6, doesn't have f5, doesn't have g4. 
So this this is a bad bishop. The bishop on e7 can't even move, so we won't discuss it at all. The knight on d8 doesn't have e6, doesn't have c6, has b7, but doesn't have a5, so a ridiculous knight. Uh, the rook doesn't have a8, so a bad rook. Has b7, has b6, a very bad rook. The rook on f8 doesn't have any space. The best black piece in the position is the knight on f8, on f6, because it has h5, f4, the thematic Roy Lopez knight maneuver. So, black is playing with one good piece on the board. Let's look at white's pieces. This rook, sort of cramped, doesn't really do much in anticipation of f5 by black or f4 by white, can do something. This bishop behind its own pawns, not really that good. This knight, huge potential I would say, because it has knight b3, knight a5, jumping squares. If this exchange ever happens, then knight b3 controls c5 as well. This knight has a great uh, plan, of course, knight h4, knight f5, or it can reroute somewhere and cause some havoc. So this knight is good as well as this knight. Uh, the dark squared bishop, not that good. If the knight moves to b3, then it has some scope, definitely better than the e7 bishop, but not such a good piece. Now we come to the rooks. Uh, the rook has the open file, and it's so much better than black's rook, then the position is so much in white's favor that, that I would say that Karpov is already strategically winning. If you turned on the engine, the engine thinks, thinks this is plus one to plus one and a half if you let him think for a long time. And it can't really find the plan. Knight b7? Knight b what, what's knight b7? I mean, where do you put that knight? So the engine likes space and it understands how bad the black position is, but it's really hard for an engine to understand how bad a human feels with, when he has less space. So in this game, Karpov took space with d5, which is theoretical. And we are three moves away from main main line theory. In this position after b4, there are still 34 games that have been played with c4, 32 with bishop d7, 16 with knight to e8. So c4 is the best move, trying to get some space on the queen side. So this is still a theoretical position. Why somebody with the black pieces would play this, especially after 1974, I don't know. The game continues knight b7. Knight to f1, rerouting the knight uh, in the uh, Royal Lopez fashion, either to e3 or to g3, controlling f5, bishop d7, bishop e3. Rook to a8, queen to d2. Still has the file. If black exchanges, rook takes a1, white still has the file. Rook f to c8, bishop d3 g6, trying to prevent uh, knight to f5 in some positions, and trying to fianchetto this bishop, more importantly. Uh, knight to g3, bishop f8, rook a2, and these are all very common uh, Royal Lopez maneuvers. And this move, rook to, rook to a2, is key. After rook to a2, if black takes, queen takes, white has the file, black doesn't have rook to a8, and white is going to play rook e to a1. If black doesn't take, then rook e to a1, and White has the file. c4 was played, chasing the bishop away. Bishop to e1, a very important move, and you're going to see why. Queen to d8, trying to defend now, and if he takes on a2, then uh, queen takes a2, he does have rook to a8. Bishop to a7, the most sadistic move in chess history, probably. After bishop to b1, and queen to d8, finally preparing rook takes, queen takes, or bishop takes, rook to a8, taking up the file. This move is just gorgeous. You have space in the center. How do you utilize that space? Take the open file. And Karpov isn't thinking about a kingside attack. He isn't thinking about sacrificing pieces. He isn't thinking about, about a pawn break. He wants to keep control of the a file, because in conjunction with his central space advantage, the black pieces will have no scope and they won't be able to move. So this move is simply preventing black from trading and giving Karpov time to double up his stuff on the A file. So the move bishop to b7 is one of uh, bishop to a7 is one of my favorite moves of all time. I just love that move. Bishop a7 saying to black, "There's nothing you can do. I'm sorry. Just resign." Knight to e8 was played, trying to reroute the knight. Bishop c2 preparing to double up. Knight c7 rook to a1. And now it's already much harder for black to do anything. Queen e7, bishop to b1. Now this the second part of the maneuver. Bishop e8, knight to e2, bringing his pieces closer. Knight to e8, knight to h2. Bishop g7, f4, 
very importantly taking space when he has the opportunity on the king side as well f6 defending f5 this was one of the crucial moves i think uh, he sees that if an exchange happens if takes okay if takes takes this is an outpost square and the pawn is defended by the bishop so if the knight ever gets to e4 these two pawns are in, are in trouble get the knight to e4 and d6 or f6 are going to be under too much pressure and the g file is open as well so after f5 unziker played g5 closing down the position bishop c2 bishop f7 knight to g3 looking at this square knight to b7 bishop to d1 h6 bishop to h5 not giving black any breathing room he has an active bishop on f7 let's exchange it let's trade it off or just keep it locked down on on the on the f7 square queen to e8 queen to d1 reinforcing the bishop and uh, more importantly preparing for a very sadistic maneuver and i don't know if you, if you've seen this game but what karpov is about to do is just so slow that it's painful to watch knight d8 rook a3 if you if you can see what he is doing i mean he wants to get his rook to a3 his other rook to a2 and then his queen to a1 after his queen gets to a1 he has total domination of the a file king f8 doing nothing uh, rook 1 to a2 king g8 knight g4 uh, the by the way the bishop isn't hanging if bishop takes knight takes queen takes knight check wins the queen so king f8 knight to e3 king to g8 bishop takes f7 getting rid of this bishop knight takes f7 queen to h5 knight to d8 queen to g6 getting into the position if the exchange happens then it's all over king to f8 knight to h5 and in this position wolfgang unziker resigned uh, you can't move the bishop you can move it to h8 you can either exchange the queen and accept even less space when the pawn gets to g6 or you can just leave it there i mean your knights have no squares your rooks have no squares this is total domination uh, almost no exchanges were made during this game and Dunziker resigned this is the power of the space advantage now let's go back to the original position of the knight c6 the chigor and royal lopez a very thematic opening d5 the most common move knight d8 a4 a very nice idea in the chigorin rook b8 a b5 a b5 b4 you are fighting for the space which you have you took central space you want the open file if there is space on the board which you can take and not allow your opponent to to take it fight for it with everything you've got and anatoly karpov showed that perfectly in this game he fought for the a file until unseeker resigned and after he took the a file let's get back to this position after rook 1 to a2 now he has complete domination of the a file obviously king to g8 knight g4 he started putting pressure on the king side as well king f8 knight e3 here takes takes queen h5 after he took the central uh, space with d5 at the start of the opening then he uh, fought for the a file until black couldn't do anything about it and now he switched his attention to the king side so he is winning in the center then on the queen side then on the king side complete domination of the board and that's what you get with extra space uh thank you very much for watching i hope you like this video on how to obtain and uh, and utilize the space advantage please let me know what you think about it any feedback is greatly appreciated once again thank you very much for the support and stay tuned for more chess see you later bye bye